Dr. Prawn, colleagues, um, as we heard, interrupted aortic uh, arch was uh, described as early as 1778 by Steidele. Uh, it's uh, conceptually, it looks like a simple lesion, but uh, the truth is that uh, it's extremely complex. It involves uh, extremely complex decision making and uh, requires many specialists to come together. First of all, perinatologist needs to recognize the lesion and, uh, and fetal cardiologist can then confirm the diagnosis and uh, plan the deliver delivery. And, um, the repair, surgical repair needs to be successful and the patients need a lifetime follow-up by cardiologists and uh, possibly for further uh, interventions, uh, surgical or cath-based procedures. The, incident, the, the incidence of uh, interrupted aortic arch, as we heard, is very low. It's a rare condition, um, about um, uh, less than 0.1 uh, uh, cases per 1,000 live births and less than 1% of all congenital heart disease. And um, here's the types of the, the, the IAA, uh, with the B being the most common one and uh, C uh, is uh, the least common. Uh, here's an example of a, uh, of a CT scan, uh, CT angio of a, of a patient with the IAA with a narrow ascending aorta giving rise to the right carotid artery and left carotid artery. The pulmonary artery is very wide and, uh, and um, the left subclavian artery arises from the uh, left patent ductus arteriosus and uh, there's aberrant right subclavian artery from the descending thoracic aorta and right aortic arch, which is common in these patients. Uh, interrupted aortic arch usually produces symptoms in the neonate coincident with the constriction uh, or closure of the arterial duct. And um, as a consequence, uh, we have profound distal hypoperfusion leading to acidosis and uh, renal, bowel, and liver ischemia. And uh, therefore, prenatal diagnosis of, is of uh, very uh, high importance so that we can plan the delivery and uh, avoid duct closure starting prostaglandin E infusion and uh, of course the patients, um, the, the children if not diagnosed prenatally are screened with pulse oximetry differential and uh, the diagnosis can be made based on that. The, basically the diagnosis and uh, the surgical treatment plan can be uh, done based on echocardiography and additional uh, imaging like uh, CT angios or MRIs are rarely needed in, in this situation. Um, IAA rarely occurs in isolation. Uh, there are uh, several, there may be several intracardiac malformations producing reduced blood flow to the fourth aortic arch and uh, the most common associated lesion is VSD accounting appearing in, in almost all cases except the ones with the aortic pulmonary window. Um, the VSD, there's often a posterior displacement of the infundibular septum and sub aortic stenosis caused by that. Um, other associated lesions include ASDs, hypoplastic aortic annulus, bicuspid stenotic aortic valves, and also complex anomalies. For instance, Rancus arteriosus and aortopulmonary window are not uncommon in these patients. Uh, VSD is almost always present and it may occupy any position within the ventricular septum. Uh, Subaortic, perimembranous, muscular, doubly committed. Morphology of the VSD most commonly compromises flow to the ascending aorta during the fetal life. And uh, the mechanisms uh, responsible for left ventricular outflow tract obstruction include uh, most often posterior displacement of uh, the infundibular septum as seen here. These pictures are from the book from, uh, by Bob Friedman and uh, Lee Benson, my mentors in Toronto. Um, here's the mal malalignment of the infundibular septum and, uh, and uh, these pictures from uh, angiographies. And uh, there's a uh, ventricular infundibular fold on the other side causing additional obstruction to the flow to the aorta. 
um, anterolateral muscle bundle of mullet, aortic valve stenosis, hyperplasia of aortic valve annulus may be causes of uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction as well. And tissue tags, for instance, from uh, tricuspid valve may cause obstruction. Uh, here's an autopsy specimen of a, a patient with a truncus arteriosus overriding the ventricular septum, giving rise to ascending aorta and uh, via the ductus to the descending aorta and the pulmonary arteries here. And the same condition in angiography, truncus arteriosus, ascending aorta, type B interruption after the left carotid and uh, ductus uh, leading to the descending aorta. Here's a patient of ours with an intracardiac anatomy, with a, that of a truncus arteriosus with a mild leak of the truncal valve. Here's another patient of ours with a, with a aortopulmonary window and type B interrupted uh, aortic arch. Uh, parasternal short axis view demonstrating the aorta large window to the pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery branches, and a wide ductus and descending aorta. And the same with color flow mapping, you can see that there's a non-restrictive flow from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. And here's the same patient uh, from a suprasternal view, the arch type B obstruction and uh, no communication to the descending aorta. And a similar patient um, on geographic picture of a, of a window between the aorta and pulmonary artery and, uh, and type A interruption with a, with a ductus shunting to the descending aorta. Here's another patient of ours, uh, CT angio because of a late diagnosis and some confusing factors in the diagnostics. And, um, Here's the ascending aorta, right uh, carotid artery, left carotid artery, and both left and right subclavian artery arising from the descending aorta. At uh, Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, they, they studied the uh, IAA patient population and found uh, non-cardiac abnormalities in 55% of the patients, uh, the George syndrome being the most common of them. Uh, dysmorphic uh, features in, in in 20 patients uh, and renal, brain, liver abnormalities as well as orthopedic uh, anomalies in, in many of the patients. Uh, especially type B, but also other types of interrupted aortic arch can be associated with the George syndrome, which is a hemozygous deletion at the chromosome 22Q11 locus, leading to maldevelopment of uh, the thymus and parathyroid glands. And uh, there's various combination of conotruncal heart defects and uh, especially type B interruption, as mentioned before. Um, T cell immunodeficiency, hypocalcemia, facial abnormalities, and cognitive speech and behavior problems um, are involved in this, uh, this syndrome. I don't, won't go, go any further into surgery uh, uh, techniques or results of surgery because I'm sure these topics will be covered by the next two speakers. But I only mentioned the material from US, the uh, Congenital Heart Surgeons uh, Society material with the uh, 472 neonates from 33 institutions, and they they studied uh, uh, the survival and uh, and late interventions in this patient cohort using a competing risks methodology over 16 years. And uh, the survival from entry in this patient population was 15, 59%, and the risk factors were young age, low birth weight, B-type IAA, and major associated anomalies. Artery intervention was needed in 28% of the patients and uh, risk factors were truncus arteriosus repair by other than anastomosis with an anterior patch technique. And uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction reinterventions in 28% as well. And, uh, and uh, the risk factors being small VSD size and uh, balloon dilatation of subaortic obstruction, which is uh, nowadays rarely performed. And uh, in post-operative follow-up of these patients, we need to pay attention to the arch obstruction, which can, can um, 
appear at any level of the arch and left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and uh, also aortic regurgitation in addition to the other, other lesions with, um, associated with um, complex congenital heart disease. Um, and in, in, in the postoperative follow-up uh, arch obstruction, there's, a, there's an angio picture with uh, multiple levels of obstruction. Um, of course, we have to take the patient history regarding uh, evidence of um, hypertension, problems with growth and weight gain, and make sure the arch is unobstructed. There may be an, a, a murmur and, and a blood pressure gradient, but we have to keep in mind that uh, there's both subclavian arteries may arise from a uh, distal from the, the, the anastomotic segment, and uh, therefore the blood pressure may not be reliable. Uh, in echo, we, we check the 2D picture of the arch and, uh, and Doppler waveforms, color flow mapping, and uh, additionally, we can, we can of course, um, image the lesions uh, with MRI and CT angios and angiography, in which case we can, in a case of uh, recurrent stenosis, we can perform angioplasty plus or minus stenting. Here's a patient of ours with a significant narrowing distal to the left subclavian artery. A little bit of a waste in a balloon, but uh, no residual gradient after balloon dilatation of this lesion. And here's another patient of ours with a residual um, requactation of the distal arch uh, treated with stent implantation. Um, a prediction of uh, post repair left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Um, May be, uh, may be a little bit uh, challenging. It, it, uh, uh, this uh, lesion may be caused by, by uh, various types of left ventricular outflow tract anatomic, um, and in different publications, uh, uh, actually, uh, there's been some variance regarding the, the risk factors, but I've listed the most common ones here. Uh, the left ventricular outflow tract uh, cross-sectional area may be small aortic valve diameter, uh, size of the mitral valve, ventricular dimensions, size of uh, the ascending aorta, and uh, anomalous origin of right subclavian artery have all been shown to be risk factors for uh, obstruction. And um, uh, why do we have uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction after uh, surgical repair? There may be various reasons, and uh, one of it can be that uh, the obstruction was ignored or not adequately repaired at the first operation, and there's uh, some residual uh, gradient in the outflow tract. The aortoseptal angle may be uncorrected. There may be continued shear stress in, in the outflow tract obstruction, and of course, recurrent arch obstruction may lead to ongoing hypertrophy of the left ventricle, and uh, thereby causing, causing some narrowing, muscular narrowing in, in the outflow tract. And uh, when we assess the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, of course, we need to take the history, um, check the murmur, and echo, pay attention to left ventricular hypertrophy and the gradient across the outflow tract. And uh, the presence of valvar stenosis and also the subaortic space with the complex fibromuscular stenosis or there may be a tunnel obstruction, and again, we can perform angiography, MRI, or CT scan to further image this lesion. Here's a patient of ours um, two years after primary repair uh, developed uh, subaortic stenosis with a gradient of 50 millimeters of mercury, and he's now booked for uh, surgery. As a summary, I can uh, list that uh, repair of uh, interrupted aortic arch and associated anomalies is a challenge. Um, microdeletion 22Q11 is well defined in patients with type B interruption of the aortic arch. Surgical results for repair of IAA and associated lesions continue to improve, and uh, moderately severe SAS may not affect early surgical mortality or outcome. This has been shown in a couple of papers. Caudal displacement of the infundibular septum may contribute to the late, late subaortic obstruction and the necessity for reoperation. And these patients require lifelong surveillance, particularly with scrutiny of the subaortic area and uh, reconstituted aortic arch. Thank you for your attention.